Good evening, everybody. Hi, C. Marcellus. Hi, Tamar. Is anyone else out there who's able to hear me? Hi, Chappelle. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, Chappelle. Hey, C. Marcellus in the house. Hey. I don't know any C. Marcellus. Hi, Chappelle. Uh, hey, Mr. Griffin. There we go. See my snows, please. I, when did this happen? <laughs> He's a student, He's a like, student formerly known as Chappelle. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't get the memo. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. Absolutely. So officially, I'm C. Marcellus Griffin. Guys. What I'm is so glad Chappelle? to be on here with you guys. But it says Chappelle every time you talk. It says Chappelle on <laughs> my screen. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 still they're still working on this. Chappelle. They're still working on that. Chappelle. Yeah, the hard part is how to change your name, right? Good job, yes, Sarah. That's the hard part. <laughs> hey guys, what about blended learning? What do you guys think about blended learning? All right, so we're going to get focused here, and uh, so. All right. Um, so, it's it's part part of the challenge is how you how you change names, <laughs> right? Hey. What about blended learning, you guys? <laughs> Stop trying to take the pressure off of you. We're having fun. Uh, all right. We're going to get started here. If you guys want to talk, Dr. we're, we're going to talk about you guys. Talk uh, here, here we go. Jeez. All right. One second here. Now I've got everybody's attention. Glad we're all focused. Oh, I think. <laughs> All right, so I'm starting my screen share. Here we go. Wow, I'm getting a delay. Are you getting a delay? Well, I can see yes. what you're doing. I can see your um, your PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. So um, for tonight, we're talking about. Uh, oh, wow! There is a delay here. Shoot. Hey, Robbie, we can hear you just fine. Can you hear me as I'm talking? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. I must. Part of my problem was I was listening to the recording at the same time as doing this. So, okay, here we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about class decisions, blended learning, and then any pressing issues at the end. Um, I want to remind you that your topics are up there, the research topics. If you cha decide to change a research topic, I just need to know about it. Um, and so that I'm aware of that because as we're moving into presentations in March, um, it's just it will help a lot to know those things so I can group people together. Um, again, I want to validate that we are having a face-to-face -face meeting on April 5th. Um, your presentations will be 10 to 15 minutes in length. Um, I will send out a doodle probably the beginning of next week as far as um, whether we're going to do it on April 2nd in the evening or on Saturday, March 29th. Um, but right now, I decided I, it was more important to get the syllabus out with all the updates than it was to worry about when we're actually doing the presentation. Just know that, so you know, your lit review is due at the end of February, and the, the reason for that is so that you get that part done, so then going from the lit review to the presentation won't take that much 
time and effort on your part. Um, of course, those are suggested due dates, not absolutes, but I would encourage you to, you know, try to get that lit review done. But again, I know you've got other time issues that you're dealing with, so that's just the way it is. Um, so the syllabus is um, finalized. Just a minute, let me respond to Debbie here. Debbie is listening in. Thanks, Debbie, for texting in. Um, as I mentioned to several of you, I just wanted to make sure I announced this as well. If you know, last week we talked about some schools that were doing competency-based education. Um, I know that some people are attending social media type workshops and things like that. So just know that you can substitute those for the community of practice assignment in kind of loose ways. And if you decide to do that, just let me know and I'll email you how it can all fit together and that sort of thing. So the syllabus is finalized. All the assignments are Blackboard. Uh, let me just verbally say this again, what I've emailed to several people. So when you're writing your blog posts, I just want you to flow with those blog posts. As far as assignments at Blackboard for your blog posts, there are a couple of assignments there where you're actually going to turn in something and reflect on them. Now, gradually, I'm going to be reading all your blog posts. So if you're not up to date on your blog posts, then I'm going to email you and say, hey, you're a little behind. Um, and I did that with a couple of people a couple days ago just so that you knew what was going on. And in, in cases where you have a blog that I can post on, then I'll post on it and write comments there. So again, the expectation is that by the end of this course, you'll have 10 blog posts reflecting on different things in this course. But what you show as assignments in Blackboard um, are just three or four ref reflection items as well. So um, I didn't think it was necessary for you to submit something every time. All right, so as far as the updated um, updated agenda items, all right, so uh, Dylan says, I wasn't clear on blog post number four. So blog post number four is the last one that where either Bill or I gave you some guidelines. So blog post number four is on your thoughts on communities you practice and the discussion. And by the way, those of you who were on that um, webinar that where you guys were all talking about that, I found it most entertaining and enjoyable about the different community of practices that you came up with in that little recording. So that was enjoyable. So a combination between writing in response to that blog post, listening to that Google Hangout, and seeing what's been posted in the discussion board, I think you guys have done a great job of defining communities of practice. And so the blog post number four is really just talking about communities of practice from your perspectives. And um, I would suggest that you <clears throat> click on other people's blogs because several people have written some great blog posts about communities of practice. Um, any other clarifications about the syllabus or the flow of the class at this point in time? So nobody's saying anything. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so Dylan, again, to clarify, so blog posts 5 through 10 are a topic of your own choosing. So it's up to you what you write about. All right, here we, all right, here we go. So I can see what's, what you're typing in the chat room. So, in fact, that's really a good way to do that. Um, if you've got specific questions or comments as we're going along, I mean, feel free to click and comment, but if you type it in the chat room, it shows me what's going on as well. Um, so what does it look like to be a blended learning teacher is really what we're going to talk about tonight. I think, um, I'll mention this again, I've probably said it before, when I first, you know, started doing presentations and stuff like that, I created my own Wikispaces web page, which is free for educators, and every time I do a presentation, then I post it there on my wiki. So um, if you want to see what's there, you just go to robdarrow.wikispaces.com and you can see all the different presentations at different times that I've done. Um, it's a good way to organize your stuff. Um, mine's a little <clears throat> messier than I'd like it to be. Other people are much cleaner than mine is, but it still gets the point across. So, All right, <clears throat> here we go. We're going to move into some participation, participation here. So, um, and those of you that are listening in, the question is, what was school like for you? So I want you to think back to a high school, to a high school class, you choose the class, and think about the class and the teacher 
in high school. And I want you to take a minute to think about what was the teaching like, the learning like, and what was the curriculum like. Um, <clears throat> and if you're sitting with somebody else, if you want to type, if you, so take a minute to think about that. And if you want to text them to me or you want to type them over on the group chat, oh, come on, Beverly. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, one class in high school. I mean, come on, there must be one memorable classroom there. Um, so that's all right. So, so Sarah, uh, I, let's. Talk, I'm gonna. I'd like you to share a little bit about. So you said that. So talk about the class you thought about and how was it high rigor and engaging? Or are um, you being sarcastic? No, I wasn't being sarcastic. I went to a school okay. called the Field School. Okay. And so. um, it was a small class size in high school. I don't know how I ended up in it. Um, it was a long story. but um, And it, the, it was based off um, the idea of tying things to, to, to life experiences and to field. And, and some of my teachers were conventional teachers and some weren't. And they were on fire about their passion about their subject. And I learned how to write in high school. She would spend hours working with me. It was um, circles. Wow. And it was really high. Actually, I, I talked about this with my husband. I feel like sometimes my high school is higher rigor than my college experience. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and where was that school? It was in Washington, D.C. Okay. And it was it was kind of zany. It wasn't. It didn't follow the any school I've ever been to, um, yeah. and it was kind of um, different. Very yeah. different. I think uh, so, Allison. You're bringing up a good point that um, I should have started by saying I want you to choose a history class, a science class, a math class, or an English class. But you point out that many elective classes were engaging and interesting, such as band or drama, those sorts of things. Um, several of you talked, so let's talk about the teaching, um, aside from the engaging classes, um, how how the teaching take place? And so, Sarah, yours is obviously the exception. It's the student, it's a, it was a mixture of teacher and student director, which sounds like ideally where it always was. So, Beverly talks about direct construction. I saw Brandon talk about lecture, 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 something along those lines. Um, Dylan talks about sages on the stage. So, it, it looks like the majority of you ex experienced that sage on the stage. Um, do you remember what the curriculum was? So I see straight out of the book. <laughs> you don't remember the books, huh, Allison? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I mean, for most of us, when we went to school, it was pretty textbook driven, right? Um, oh, that's interesting, see, Marcellus, that the, you felt like the teachers had more. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? So you said the teacher had more creative license than teachers do today. Um, tell me a little bit more about that and why you believe that. Well, you know, today it's not uncommon to see teachers with the main textbook and have, you know, all the supplementary and ancillary, uh, you know, tools. But I didn't see that so much when I was in high school. Teachers usually brought in a lot of creative things and they wanted us to be stimulated on a creative basis. And so I didn't see as many uh, publisher textbooks in those kinds of things. And so, and, and so experience. So today, you uh, you feel like teachers are more constrained to teach a certain way than they were when many of us went to school. I think so, but I, you know, all jokes aside, I really think it had a lot to do with the honors courses that I was in. Those teachers had a lot more creative license to do what they wanted to do. They were less restricted. Right. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, who talked about the Spanish book Dime? Yeah, Dylan, I rem even I remember that book. And then Terry uh, texts in uh, teacher domination. 
Yeah, so it was pretty teacher directed. That's for sure. Um, dang, Beverly, you would learn math facts with food. That sounds pretty good. Um, memorization, those kinds of things. All right, so let's talk a minute about the t what's what technology do you remember being used in those classes? All right, so none is one answer. <laughs> Uh, videos. So, so Dylan, do you? <laughs> so I'm going to date myself here a bit. So, <laughs> when you say videos, was that um, video cassettes or video film strips or those big video reels? Oh, VHS. Okay. Yes. So I remember my <laughs> early <laughs> abacus. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the so I I can remember teaching my first year's teaching fifth grade to that I would order films for the whole year coordinated from the county office based on our science themes and they'd come in. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. I'd, I'd have my trained students on how to run that projector for sure. Oh, that's right. Film strips, especially in driver's ed. Yep. I remember that as well. So, all right. So we've got film strips, uh, film projectors, uh, videos. I guess there were, was TVs in your classroom if you saw some of those. Um, C. Marcellus talks about the overhead projector and the VCR. So that's the technology. So, of course, all of that has changed, right? So then that's when you begin to think about that. That's, of course, why I'm asking you this question. So why is this stuff all important? So blended learning has the pen potential to really better engage learners and you'll hear me talk more about that as we're going along here. If if we don't know what it is, we can't identify it and if we once we know what it is, then we can count it and we can research it. But until we define what that is, it's very difficult and we're in this midst of really defining what blended learning is. As I'll show you in a minute and you've heard me say before, we pretty much know what online learning is. And we pretty much know what face-to-face -face learning is, but it's this stuff in between that's a little messy and murky. Um, uh, one example is so um, California school districts were all sent out the e-learning census, um, and oh, I didn't include that link. Give me one second here. Um, so, uh, so Brian Bridges, who runs C-Learn. Um, took it upon himself last year to create this um, e-learning census and send it out to school districts <coughs> to get them to answer these questions. And the questions really had to do with blended learning. Um, and he, as he put in his blog post this last week, of the 75 districts or charters um, that have the census for three years, 43 are elementary schools. Do any of you know how many school districts there are in the state of California? Um, I'm going to I'm going to change my screen so I can see your faces. So, oh, you're not all faces aren't all there. All right. So, it's more than 221, it's more than 853. 12 1800 is too high, so it's 12 I think it's 1262 something like that. Um, so that's the number of school districts including all the small school districts which Exactly, 1260-ish. And I'm, I think some of you probably work in some of those small school districts and can appreciate that. But So the initial California Learning Census says 28 of these are not now and they, and they don't have no plans to utilize online or blended learning based on the survey. Four indicated they're currently planning to implement some sort of e-learning and then four indicated near two that they were in the planning stages and then stopped and two said that they're year two and then stop, that they're not going to do it. So it's kind of interesting when you see results like that. Um, in that survey, he used these four models of blended learning to ask people what types of blended learning they're doing and they will, um, yeah, good job, Dylan. No problem with Googling stuff. Okay, cool. Um, anyway, so when you're doing surveys like that, it's important that you know what these definitions are and that sort of thing. And, and the definitions, um, you know, apply both to the higher ed level and to K-12. Um, so here's two definitions. Um, so th these guys, Zubin and Hartman and Moscow, 
said it. Blended learning should be viewed as a pedagogical approach that combines all of these things together. And then Bunk and Graham, who really uh, are more higher ed, gave this base definition that it really combines face-to-face -face learning with computer-mediated learning. That that's the essence of it. Um, but I'll point out in a little bit that it's really more than just that. And that if you're only doing it at that level, you're missing out on what it can possibly do. Now these guys, uh, Seaman and um, Alan Seaman and Garrett, who've done a lot of higher ed and K-12 research on blended learning at online learning throughout these proportions in 2007 and they said they they gave these terms traditional web facilitated blended hybrid and then online and they really believe that you got to have 80 percent or more has got to be online so I think I can live with that definition for online because even if it's 80 percent and 20 percent is the kid meeting with a teacher once a week then it, it meets that requirement of 80 percent so if you are one of those people that really wants a percentage here it is I think their blended hybrid percentages are a little low there um, I think to really be blended it needs to be a little bit more than that but that's what's their definition and then you see web facilitated so they came up with these initial definitions in 2007 and then uh, on the <coughs> document I sent you um, I expanded on their definitions here to better define all of those different roles. Um, so we're going to get to that in just a second, but um, here's the most widely used K-12 definition for blended learning. Um, so Horn and Staker out of the Christensen Institute um, went out and saw a bunch of schools about five years ago, and after they observed all these schools, wrote up case studies, then they came up with this definition. They said it's a formal education program which a student learns at least part online and some control over time, place, path, and or pace. And then they added this, and at least in part in a supervised brick and mortar place away from home. So like in a school or something along those lines. Now, that was in 2011, and then in 2012, last year, they expanded the definition even more, and they added that bottom section where they said the modalities along each student's learning path within a course or subject are connected to provide an integrated learning experience. I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around what that really means, but I think in essence what they're saying is that if you're working in a course management system like Blackboard, then there are assignments that you could do at school, there are assignments you could do at home or wherever you are, and that if the content is presented in the right way, in a variety of ways, and students could pull the learning that works best for them. So there might be printed information, there might be videos like flip classroom types of stuff, um, and there might be, you know, simulations or other ways that they can get the learning, so to speak. But that they're they're all connected as part of that experience. Um, so that last part really more addresses the pedagogy of teaching versus those other ones. I mean, it's one thing to talk about these models. So there are these four blended learning models that they talk about. I'm going to show you an image of them here. So on the left you can see that these models are more brick and mortar and the ones on the right are more online learning. So they call this the rotation model. You can see below blended learning there, there's the rotation model, the flex model, what they call the self-blend model. Oh, they just changed that to another term. Oh, I forget the new term. but. And then their enriched virtual model. And so they kind of put this on this continuum of blended, and you can see that um, they put the flipped classroom model under the rotation model because the idea is that students rotate into a computer lab and rotate out, or rotate onto computers and rotate out, or rotate home and watch videos and rotate back. So that's why they put them all under that particular model. Now, I would argue that rotation, flex, and self-blend are truly blended learning. And rich virtual is online learning. It's not blended learning. Um, because if you're an online class, you're an online class. So their enriched virtual model is really an online program or an online course in addition to their regular face-to-face -face day. But So these three, these three models, rotation, flex, and self-blend, are really the three different types of blended learning models that they have put forward. Um, and what I'd like to ask you right now is, as you think about your various institutions you work in, 
which is, would you say is um, most prevalent? Let's let's start with higher ed first. Let's start with that one. So when we think about blended learning in higher education, and you heard that um, the Dylan, they they correspond somewhat. Uh, mm, now I'd ignore the yellow boxes. Take that away. Just focus on the the models, rotation, flex, or self blend. So, with higher education, what's the typical model of blended instruction? So think about your college courses, or just think about your many of your doctoral courses. Um, I will say this that. Um, from my observation, you guys in the Bakersfield cohort have more of a blended learning instruction approach than face-to-face -face students in the Fresno cohort. Um, so how would, what would you describe the model generally used? Um, how many think it's more rotation model where you kind of rotate in and out of computers? I'm looking at your faces. Oh, some of you have faces, some of you don't. So, um, all right, I want you to type in the chat room now. Okay. So in the chat room, we're thinking of higher ed right now. So you're going to type rotation, flex, or self-blend as the, the one that is most used as far as a model for higher education. Either type rotation, flex, or self-blend. So I see a couple flexes, so then that, that means that you get a computer out and use it when it's needed, or the instructor brings that out, versus a rotation, which is on kind of an ongoing schedule, you rotate into a computer lab. Okay, and Dylan says it's kind of more towards the flex self-blend model. Yeah, it, and it depends on the course as well, right? Okay, great. All right. So, so really, if we think of higher ed, it's, it's kind of more the two and the three, kind of the flex model, self-blend, depending on the instructor and that sort of thing. Now, as we switch to K-12, which, which model do you most observe in K-12? Rotation, flex, or self-blend? So let's see. All right, those of you who are listening in, text me about K-12, what you think K-12 is. Well, so, to answer the question verbally, go for, for it, most go. school sites, K-12, it's been my experience that it's rotation, and it's simple economics. You know, yep. even though we're 15, 20 years into the technological revolution in education, most districts haven't been able to find the funds to equip every classroom. So computer labs have been the only solution. And for some teachers, it's frustrating because you don't get in there often enough. For other, it's really frustrating because the times you do get in there, it doesn't really <coughs> you know, suit the needs for you and your students or there are glitches that you're not used to because you're not in there often enough. And so it's more of a rotation model. There just aren't the resources to go that route unless you have a, a Gates scholarship or something of that nature where you start off with a technologically based school. Good point. Um, hey, Ben, talk a little bit about Kawea schools, what that means so people know. Yeah, Ben, talk about our Kawea school. <laughs> Still a non quia hater. So, <laughs> no, I, I loved Quia when I was at a Quia school, but I wish they would have been able to spread it around to some of the non Quia schools. But um, so Scott they, Pine, you didn't have to leave us. <laughs> so they, you know, Quia schools receive millions and millions and millions of dollars <laughs> um, to, you know, depending on what their goals are and how they wanted to frame. I guess their expenditures, um, they have the access of buying a lot of technology and, and that's a smart thing right now with SBAC coming online is to make sure you, you fill up every empty classroom with computers so you have a lot of different labs that you're going to be able to access when test, the test comes around. But um, it 
it stands for Quality Education Investment Act. That's that uh, one more acronym. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it's great for the schools that have it. That's for sure. I'd and, really uh, like to see him say that with a straight face and not his moniker in front of everybody. Is he telling the truth or not? Yeah. Well, we'll we're gonna, we'll take everybody on face value today, anyway. Um, so, and Dylan brought up this, and, and uh, Ben mentioned it as well. That co with Common Core and the assessments, once those move forward, um, that's going to push people more into blended learning, because people because schools will not be successful if there's not a blended learning approach. And it's not just kids working on computers, right? It's also kids knowing how to manipulate computers and that sort of thing. Um, are just as a side question are are all of your schools are going to do something with Common Core testing this year, correct? At least in the K-12 level, isn't that right? Yes. Okay. So, um, and did any of you participate in the pilot last year with Common Core? Any of the assessments? Nope. I'd okay. Be. So I, I'll take that as a, a no for most people. Oh, so Allison, you did. So. At the schools where people did that, you already have an idea of what that was like and how things are being moved in that direction. So, all right. So those are excellent points that you've all made about blended learning and why that's important. So, um, back to the um, <laughs> interesting point, Dylan. So, just to clarify, blended learning is not just a bunch of computers on a desk and a teacher with a whiteboard up in front there. Okay, it's it's not just that. It's utilizing course management systems and things like that. And it's it's not just like a light switch you turn on one day. You don't just suddenly become a blended learning school overnight or a blended learning classroom. It takes lots of things to think about, and it's it's a pedagogical shift. And as you know, pedagogical shifts take time. So when we talk about that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when we talk about face-to-face -face teaching. We got students in the classroom, teacher in the classroom. Interaction is pretty much face to face, mostly verbal, some visual. There's generally a fixed schedule of classes and a prescribed curriculum based on standards. In online teaching, most of those things are the same, except the teacher's online, and more of the interaction is online with videos, email, more visual, less verbal. Um, and students have flexible schedule for work completion and Ideally, there is a prescribed curriculum based yeah. on the standards of text. That's all the same. Um, were you going to say something, Bev? Or somebody else? No. Okay. Um, and, and so, as we think about that, the other thing to think about is, you know, what does blended learning really look like for a teacher? Um, so, I've shown you this slide before, but I want to emphasize it again that we know that teaching and learning involves three three things and more of course you know you can dr drill down in any one of these we got a student and where that student is we got a teacher and where the teacher is and we've got content and where that content is those three things are all part of thinking about blended learning or the different models or that sort of thing because yeah. and that's one of the problems with the Horn and Staker definition or any model you can't just say, oh, here's the model, now we're doing blended learning. Because each one of these is part of the blended learning formula, so to speak. And you can't just say, okay, we're going to the computer lab, and I think as Eugene, as you pointed out earlier, you know, you just rotate into a computer lab and then you rotate out, you know, that may have some effect, but it's not as effective as other models of the use of technology in classrooms or, you know, one-to-one -one type of programs and that sort of thing. So keep that in mind that when you talk about teaching and learning, you got the student, the teacher, and content, and it doesn't matter if you're talking online, blended, or anything else. So um, I've shared this slide with you before, and it's the continuum that I sent out to you. And so in just a second, I'm going to have you um, post something. So if you haven't looked at that document, um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to identify where you fit on this continuum if you were teaching, and maybe some, and I know some of you are teaching and some of you aren't teaching right now, but if you were teaching, where on this continuum would you put yourself? Would you be pretty much textbook enhanced using a textbook? 
Would you integrate in some technology like digital whiteboards, things like that? Would you use online resources? Are you more blended in the sense of putting stuff into a course management system and using that all the time? Or would it be, you know, totally online teaching? So um, now I want you to look at that handout, but basically you've got these five different areas. And what I want you to do now is on your computers, I want you to go to this Padlet. And on this Padlet, um, and I'll show it to you on my screen in just a second, but the bottom line is I want you to put one Padlet up for yourself. Just put your name on it and put where you fit along this continuum and put one Padlet up for your institution or the department you work in, whether it's higher ed or K-12, it doesn't really matter. So um, I'm going to give you a minute to do that. I'm going to change my screen here and show you that screen so we can watch these results come in live streamed. All right, so now. All right, so now I'm going to share my screen again, and you'll see these live results coming up. Come on. Okay, so here's the Padlet. I can see that uh, Jasmine put herself more as textbook enhanced, and Sarah more blended. That's great. Um, I should see everybody else clicking on there, putting a name. And then you can just put the name of your school if you want to talk about. So think about your whole department. Think about your whole school if you'd like, or grade level, or a department, or um, one part of a university where they would, where you'd put that in there. And those of you listening in, um, the Padlet, oh, I'll email the Padlet out. You know what? That's what I'll do. Because um, you probably can't see it in the chat room. Of course not. But I'll email that to you right now. One second here. All right, Padlet coming to your way via email. So we can see these results popping up here. Um, so most people are putting themselves more towards uh, textbook enhanced and technology enhanced. All right, so as you think of your institutions now, okay, I see names up there. I see five names. I, there's more people listening than that. Uh, all you got to do is click in there and put your name somewhere and then move it accordingly. Um, and and now, th now th think of your institution or your department or your grade level and choose that as a name and put where you see them as a whole. So you could put the name of your school, you could put, you know, sixth grade teachers, you could put science teachers, you could put the nursing department. Um, So again, when you click on the click somewhere on the Padlet, uh, the first thing you do is type in a name of some sort, and then you can move it around. So Brandon's school and district uh, looks like it's kind of technology enhanced, moving towards web enhanced. And um, Tamara and Ben both pointed out that as adjuncts at their local university, they're moving towards more blended, and away it looks like away from textbook. Now I'm curious about the organizations where you work. So okay, so Wayside Elementary School, okay, is more looks like more textbook enhanced. Um, how about some other schools there or departments? Taft College entirely online. Okay, well yeah that. Okay, so that moves towards the online environment for sure. So at uh, K-12 West School, technology enhanced, which would suggest that there is technology for teachers to use. They might use a projector. Um, great. All right. So this 
I was I wasn't sure how this would work out. So this worked out pretty well. I appreciate mm -hmm. the uh, input there and that sort of thing along the continuum to begin thinking about where things fit on this. And from a professional development perspective, showing a visual like this can help teachers to know where they play or, or where they fit and all that sort of thing. And know that anybody can use a Padlet. It's free. So, um, okay. I see some people were able to access it and some weren't, which is okay. All right, so back to where we were talking about here. I'm glad that uh, Google is cooperating tonight, letting me go back and forth. Okay, so when you think about some of the continuums, we talk about teacher-centric versus student-centric. Um, generally, textbook enhanced teaching and learning is more teacher-centric versus online is more student-centric. Because as with this class, to a certain extent, you're on your own and how you're you know, completing these assignments and that sort of thing. And a combination of those is somewhere in the middle of web online enhanced, technology enhanced, uh, not necessarily online. And then the other continuum we look at is teacher versus student control of teaching and learning. So generally more in the textbook enhanced world, there's more teacher control. Online, there's more student control. And there's a lot of research coming out that talks about this shared control being the kind of the sweet spot which engages student learning and that sort of thing and especially when you integrate it in with the use of technology then students really excel in that kind of environment. Um, the control of time and pace is is challenging obviously in a traditional school versus a charter or an online school but you know generally in most schools there's a set time structure you know 45 or 50 minute periods students rotate depending on the school you're at or a certain time period that people are bound to, whether you're teaching in a higher ed course or whether you're teaching in a middle school. There's certain time periods. Um, and when there's, less, when there's less control of time and space, where there's more flexibility for students how to use that time, then, then they're moving more towards the blended and online environment. Um, yeah, that's a good point, Dylan. So um, one of the schools I observed uh, two weeks ago was the um, Silicon Valley Flex Academy up here in San Jose. So they have the SF Flex, Acad uh, Flex Academy and the Silicon Valley Flex Academy, both, both high schools. And then we also observed the Rocket Ship School, which is in San Jose as well. So in the, both the Flex Academies, it's generally flexible time. Although students show up at a certain time and go home at a certain time, how they work during the day, they have these like 90 minute periods where they can work, decide to work all day on math if they wanted to, or they could do a little English, a little science, and then focus more on math the next day. Um, the teachers keep track of where they're at, making progress and that sort of thing. At the end of each week, uh, the teachers and the students sit down and talk about the goals, how they did with their goals that week, and what goals they're working on for the next week. And the schools, um, have what they call playlists that they students help to determine what that looks like. So when we talk about control of time and pace, that's what we're talking about there. I will also add to this that those schools are all charter schools and it's much easier with a brand new school or a brand new charter school to put you know the culture of blended learning in place than transforming a traditional school. Um, as many of you can imagine. So as we think about the different themes or the different models of the Horn and Staker, the rotation model generally you see more in a textbook slash technology enhanced classroom versus enriched virtual which is really an online course. And like I mentioned earlier, a student may attend face to face all day long and take one class online or they might take, you know, one of six periods might be their online class. So um, I've shown you this visual before. Um, textbook enhanced kind of again you, when you look at the teacher student curriculum that's kind of what it looks like I'm not going to talk much about these quadrants except to say that in the textbook enhanced world it's more paper um, technology enhanced you add in more computers and stuff like that um, the uh, uh, remind me of that question a little bit later Dylan about uh, the pedagogy of the teachers there um, technology enhanced is more along those lines 
Here's Web Online Enhanced in the sense that you there's more online stuff happening with students. In the Web Online Enhanced Classroom, I would expect to see more use of course management system such as Blackboard or Moodle or, um, oh shoot, what's that one that a lot of students at the elementary school level is called? Oh, this it's escaping me right now. Um, I'll remember it in a minute. Anyway, in the Web Online Enhanced world, they're using more stuff is done online. Students, more assignments are being turned in online versus turning them in by paper. Um, Edmodo, that's one of the um, systems that a lot of elementary schools are using. Uh, my sister teaches a fifth grade classroom in San Jose, and she and I were talking over the weekend about the use of Edmodo, and she pulls it out every once in a while for a unit she's doing. And I said, well, why don't you just <coughs> use it with all your classes and what you're doing? And it, with a blended model, of course, there's more computers, more online stuff, and that sort of thing. And, you know, it moves more towards the online world. So um, I may call the organization I work for, and the quality online teaching standards addresses these blended learning continuums. And so here's, like, attendance student learner's role. You can see on the far left there's less online instruction, and on the far right there's mostly online instruction. If we look at individualized instruction, in the less online instruction, students really are expected to kind of keep the same instructional pathway. But in a more of an online instruction, students can be more personalized and that sort of thing. Um, and it, that, again, that's why you need the technology. It's too hard to do that with that. Um, and then uh, when you think about curriculum, when you go from less online to mostly online, I'll just grab one of these assessments. So whole class assessments are primarily in the classroom which is less online instruction, but at the other end of the continuum where it's mostly online is there's more digital or real-time data that gives feedback to individual teachers. Again, that's one of the great values of blended learning is having a blended learning dashboard that can really do that sort of thing. Um, and then instructional support, um, I'll just grab one of these, the support models in the less online instruction. Um, there's more direct student learning versus the more online is it's a combination of collaboration and coordination where there may be more technology-based tools that students can go to get the kind of support they need. So again, those are from the uh, standards of quality from the organization I work for, for INACOL. So when you think about blended learning or blended teaching, it's a combination of many factors. And you can see on the left, here's what it looks like for the student. You know, there's flexibility of time. Work is turned in mostly online. The student participates in an ongoing way in online discussion boards. Um, Web 2.0 tools are integrated in, and they're actively engaged in the content. Now, you could argue that students can actively engage in printed contact content as well, and textbooks to a certain extent. But I think as we would agree that as we um, start using more technology, you see a different level of engagement. Now, it gets more complex with the teacher, right? When you think about how do you personalize that learning and how do I get the data from the stuff the students are doing so that it can better inform my teaching and, and what I should turn over to teachers and that sort of thing. Um, so the, the teacher in a blended teaching environment is somehow meeting with students in a whole class and in groups and individually that the groups are changing on a weekly basis based on the needs of the students depending on the class. Um, obviously, a teacher needs to be adept with using a variety of Web 2.0 tools and technology, um, and and knowledge of the curriculum is critical, right? That there's, you know, knowledge of it in the face-to-face -face world, so then how it should look online and how, what kind of strategies to use along along those lines. So Dylan asked the question earlier. He said, "What kind of pedagogy do the teachers use at Silicon Valley Prep?" So if you walk into Silicon Valley Prep or San Francisco Valley Prep schools, the first thing you'll notice are these large, what they call flex centers. And at Silicon Valley Prep, where it's 6 through 12, there was a prep center for 6th and 7th grade, a prep center or a tech flex center for 8th grade, and a flex center for 9 through 12. Students sit in cubicles like they're sitting in an office, and generally it's around the, in the center of the room and on the outside of the room are meeting spaces for teachers to pull groups of students as needed. The, student, the teacher is monitoring how the students are doing from their 
dashboard, and the students are keeping track of it as well. Uh, the students I observed, they get they have like kind of a speedometer sort of thing that shows them, you know, red, yellow, green, how the kind of progress they're making on their units and where should they should be and that sort of thing. The teacher meets with each student once a week to talk about how they're doing the work and that sort of thing. And again, the teacher pulls groups based on the needs of the students as they're working through the lessons. So they may see that a student's having trouble with some sort of some math concepts. A couple of them may be having that. Um, then they pull the group with that small group. So Bev, yeah, I would agree that um, teachers are much more facilitators in that kind of a system uh, than they are in a traditional system in many of our schools. And they truly are facilitating that learning um, by talking to students, walking, circulating around, talking to the students, pulling groups together. Um, there are, um, if you think of um, the six period day at most high schools across five days, so that's five times six, so that's roughly 30 periods a week. Within those 30 periods a week, there are about five of those periods that are blocked out for specific purposes that students need to be somewhere doing something like a science lab or something like that. But the other 25 blocks of time are up to them how they fill those in and that sort of thing. And so um, they they also have a group collaboration time as one of those blocks of learning. So that's, um, that's how it looks at the Silicon Valley Flex. At Rocket Ship, which is a K through six, a K through five school, they pretty much use the rotation model, uh, first, second, and third grade, where students every day are spending 90 minutes on the computers based on specific skill needs. And then secondly, uh, fourth and fifth grade are more this big room where they're doing more of the flex model where the computers are coming in and um, coming in and out depending on the needs of the students. So those are just some of those other models of charter schools. Um, Allison, did you have something you wanted to ask? Sure. In fact, um, what I'll do is I'll I'll email you my uh, quick summaries of those schools just so um, please don't publish those because they're really not ready for prime time, so to speak. But within those are my opinions of which are more blended than others. Um, and when we so, um, but if I were to name, okay, so I'll just say this out loud here: the schools to really look at if you really wanted to see a blended learning school in action. And again, these are only charter schools. Um, we didn't see any traditional, I mean, we did see a traditional school in Oakland where one teacher was really, uh, an algebra one teacher, who was really blending the instruction. Students would log in every day to their Google Docs and look at assignments there, and they were all working at their own pace. And the teacher from time to time would pull a group up to the center of the room, otherwise the students were all working on computers. Um, it's very hard to do blended teaching if students are not on computers um, and if teachers don't have access to a lot of technology and that sort of thing. So I'll you know, mention Ron, that's Yeah, go ahead. Um, if anybody wants to see some blended learning, it's not totally pure, but at uh, our school and three other schools, Highland High School, um, I want to say uh, Foothill High School, and one other high school in the current high school district, we now have blended learning happening in some of our algebra classes and using the TI calculator with the navigator system in combination with Dr. Lutz at CSUB and TI Math Forward. You can look up Math Forward on the Texas Instrument website. Um, but basically the navigator um, works with the uh, new TI Inspire Colors CXs and you can send out actual Word documents, packets of information, assignments, and the kids can turn it in electronically. They log in. You have a class page. You can make different students the presenter and things of that nature. And pretty much for about 80% of every class period, the navigator is the primary tool for instruction. And of course, the teacher has one as well. And it works in conjunction with your smart board, your, your projector, and the whole nine yards. Awesome. Um, you know, when I come down there for the final class, maybe I'll come down a day early. It'd be fun to look at those. Good to know. Um, so I, with the charter schools, the the ones that we saw that 
in the San Jose area really um, is um, Rocket Ship Silicon Flex Academy. So if you wanted to take a trip with a staff, those would be some of the schools I'd go see. And then, um, oh, what's the other one? Shoot, I forget the name of the other one. But you'll tell, uh, I'll email you all out kind of my summaries of them, and I'll put the, the what we would consider the pure blended learning schools at the very top. Um, and of course, some of these schools are just starting out, right? So they started out and only hired teachers specifically for this purpose. So that, you know, makes a difference of how you get pedagogy to go in a certain direction. All right, so with that, um, I'm going to read a couple things to you, and I want to know if this is blended teaching or not. So um, a teacher posts an article online for students to read. Um, and you can just type in the text text box, yes, no, or maybe. And those of you listening in, text in, yes, no, or maybe. A teacher posts an article online for students to read. Yes, no, or maybe. All right, so several people put maybe. So uh, Brandon Palmer, you want to talk a little bit about why you said maybe? Did I lose your... There you go. Um, well, it just depends on what else I guess it's in conjunction with because if you're getting blended learning and you post an article online, then it's blended learning. If you're not doing blended learning and you post an article online, then it's not blended learning. Good point. The context is very important. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of these. I want to show you these other pictures. So as you think about um, online and blended learning, also think of it as a catalyst for change and transformation in teaching, which is part of the reason we're talking about this. So here's a picture of a guy standing in front of a digital whiteboard. So yes, no, or maybe for this image here. Is this blended? Yes, no, or maybe? Mm, I got a no from a text said no. Where's the picture? Some are saying yes. So it's an image of something. Maybe, could be. Yeah, it just all depends on the context. All right, here's another picture. So is this a blended learning classroom? Yes, no, or maybe? Okay, great. So, so several of you are saying maybe there. So I'm wondering why why you would say maybe. Um, possibly. I could, I, I could answer that again. Or someone else could answer. All right, talk a little bit more about that. Is that the, is that could that be the twenty percent? So they're working online and they're coming for. Um, Instruction. Okay. See, I would think. That, um, so, from my perspective, um, like a lab there, or something. There are no electronic devices in the pic in this picture. So, how can you have blended learning if there's no technology? So, I, I guess I would suggest that this this is you know students are all facing forward. Um, but I like what Sarah put in the chat box. I see PDAs on their desk, so it could be BYOD. <laughs> Boy, you're looking real closely there. I can't see it, but okay. I'll have to find a better picture where there's no technology showing. So the point yeah. is, it, this image really is when there's no technology present, you can't really have true blended learning. So <laughs> that was the purpose of that one. Um, and then, you know, kids, a kid individually working on a computer. Um, we can go from there as well. So, um, and then here's a group of kids in a computer lab, which you know I'll just say that obvious. You know, if the, it's hard to tell if these kids are there all day. Um, if you look closely at the images on here, every student is on the same page. So, you know, if students are going to customize their own learning, you would hope that they could would not all necessarily be on the same page. Um, but in a rotation model for blended learning, that's a start. 
Good point. Okay. All right. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about blended learning. Um, any thoughts or comments or reactions from any of you? So do you think you could walk into a classroom now and identify if it's a blended learning classroom or not? And I, I think Eugene did a great job of, t of describing some of that, right? Um, you got to have technology. You, you got There's got to be some sort of course management system or easy way for students to turn in work digitally. Um, yeah, good point, Dylan. All right, last slide. Any uh, pressing issues anybody wants to talk about? Uh, good point, Bev. Uh, right. The blended learning environment is less teach, teacher talking and more student engagement with technology. And I interrupted somebody, so go for it. Uh, no, my question was, um, are we absolutely uh, meeting on April 5th? I thought there was an option to do it so we weren't meeting on April 5th. But regardless, uh, I'm one of those people that would have to bail on the April 5th meeting um, because I won't be in town. I'll be out of state at a wedding. Yeah, just talk to me about that separately. Yeah, so we are we are meeting April fifth. So. Okay. But if I come uh, visit your schools on April April fourth, we we'll have an individual class. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Okay. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Then I'm going to stop the broadcast. So just know that, okay, so I'm going to close out this Hangout and this one. Um, I'll send out another link. So if any of you want to come back in and talk about any aspect of the course, I'll hang out and we'll talk about that. Um, if not, then enjoy the rest of your evening and keep up the great work. You guys are doing an awesome job. It's, I've, I'm really impressed with the discussion board pieces because um, I've been able to read that stuff. I haven't had a chance to really go and look at all your blog posts, but I will get to those this week. So anyway, so keep up the great work.